Hi everyone, and welcome back to the uh, Arthritis Broadcast Network. Uh, we're here uh, at the uh, CRA AHPA Joint Scientific Meeting 2020 in beautiful Victoria, uh, hashtag CR Arthritis. Uh, my name is Graham Reed. I'm uh, with the Canadian Spondylitis Association and happy to be one of the members of uh, the broader coalition putting this on. Uh, I get the distinct pleasure of uh, sharing an interview with Dr. Jonathan Chan, a uh, associate professor at UBC yes. and member at Artis Health mm -hmm. Clinic. Yes. Also a uh, uh, member of Spark and a supporter of the CSA. Yes. And a veteran of the ABA, uh, ABN. So this is not your first year here, mm -hmm. and we're excited to have you back. So I wonder if you could. Um, just share a little bit more about yourself and about uh, your practice within rheumatology. No. So um, I'm a rheumatologist out of Vancouver and uh, I do general rheumatology but I have a clinical and research interest in axial and peripheral spondyl arthritis uh, and of course there's a bit of overlap with psoriatic arthritis as well there. Uh, I did a bit of time before, uh, after graduating from rheumatology and before starting practice in Toronto so I uh, have some connection there and uh, a lot of the national, international research cohorts come out of there so I do enroll patients who are interested in sharing their experience, helping us increase our understanding of the condition uh, by enrolling them in, their, in those various cohorts and do some clinical, some clinical trials and some investigator initiated research in addition to clinical work uh, in those areas. So you, you mentioned you got into rheumatology a little bit later, can you describe your journey to rheumatology and then maybe any recommendations that you might have for people contemplating. For sure, yeah. You know, rheumatology is a little bit of a black box for most <laughs> physicians, not a, a very big black box. Uh, I think a lot of physicians know about the rheumatology shotgun of rheumatoid factor ANA, ENA. And uh, I, I had no clue uh, what it was up until uh, my second year of res internal medicine residency. And I, at the time I was thinking about various options, I was very interested in cardiology, um, and I did one rotation with uh, Kam Shajania, he's another, uh, he's the head of our department, and loved it, and uh, decided to do some research and, and commit, and I have no regrets, it's been a fantastic career. Uh, anyone who's thinking about it, you should explore it. Uh, I think sometimes it can be a bit daunting, uh, I was sharing earlier that uh, I've had a couple of medical students shadow in my office, and, and I, uh, I felt a little bit bad because you need a firm grasp of all of internal medicine because our diseases are multi-system, and so you need to have a little bit of experience with dermatology, cardiology, respirology, nephrology, um, and neurology, and if you're, you know, if, if you're coming uh, in and not that familiar with those fields, then uh, it can feel a bit overwhelming. But uh, for any medical student uh, or resident who might be interested, you know, hang in there. Uh, it becomes, uh, it, you know, once the smoke clears, it's a very rewarding field. There's a lot of, um, uh, a lot of good you can do, a lot of uh, therapeutics that are quite effective. Uh, and identifying these uh, rare multi-system diseases are, is very satisfying. It's like being a real life Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> uh, that's, that's what I would say. And very good for, for those patients living with these conditions. Absolutely, and, yeah. You know, on AB, uh, ABN, we've said that we need more rheumatologists. There's, a, there's definitely a demand. So putting that out to the Twitterverse. Mm -hmm. Now, I know uh, some of those lessons you shared with the resident pre-course. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could share if there are other things that you might have uh, instilled on uh, those <laughs> residents as you navigate your... Uh, your journey. Yeah, so I, uh, I, I had the opportunity and the privilege of uh, just sharing uh, some of my experience with the, uh, with the residents and how we identify patients. Uh, and I think there's a bigger emphasis on identifying patients early. Uh, the CSA was involved in an international um, study where we were collecting information of patients with spondylitis. And uh, the data is not out yet, but uh, you know, a sneak peek. Uh, you know, there was quite a few patients who were on uh, permanent disability, uh, either uh, part-time uh, disability. There was a lot of presenteeism, and uh, you know, we were seeing a trend, unofficially, it's not published yet, <laughs> between you know delay in diagnosis and whether or not patients were able to go to work, 
presenteeism, uh, presenteeism, absenteeism. So I think that's, uh, in, we, in all the areas of rheumatology, we know that there's a window of opportunity and early treatment is better. And it's not been definitively shown in spondylitis because it is, there's often a 10 year delay from symptom yeah. onset to, to diagnose. And, and you know, we see that patients who get treated earlier tend to do better. Uh, you know, if you wait 20 years before you start therapy, your response is gonna be lower. Uh, but you know, 20, 20 years is a long time, and ideally we can get it down to, uh, you know, two years would be, you know, that's that's early, that's very early for, for spondylitis, which, you know, for the patient living with that, two years of pain and wondering what's going on, that's, you know, th we could do better than that. Um, other things that I uh, tried to instill and, and that I've learned is that, you know, this disease does creep up on people, and it's not, don't often wake up with excruciating pain, usually it builds up slowly, and a lot of patients, their function just slowly tapers off. And we see uh, patients who tell me that, uh, you know, I ask them also, you know, your x-rays demonstrate you definitely have spondylitis. Um, how are you doing? They have no, no back pain, I don't need therapy, but here are my disability forms. <laughs> or they'll, they'll say, I don't have any pain, but then, you know, they may have other diseases, so let's say Crohn's, colitis, and they get treated. And then all of a sudden they say, I feel like a million bucks, my back pain's better. And I say, well, I thought you had no back pain. <laughs> and they said, I thought that was normal. I thought it was normal to have to just feel like that every day and yeah. not being able to totally. run. I thought I thought that. So um, I think that's um, something that we, in addition, you know, just getting people to fill it uh, zero to 10, how bad is your pain, doesn't always capture the burden of disease. And, and asking for a functional inquiry, you know, are you missing work? Are you still exercising? Are you still interacting with your loved one? That's That's really important. Yeah, and, and obviously for patients, yeah. all those things are like top of mind mm -hmm. at all points. That just reminds me of uh, the session that we had before the official opening of the CRA, which is the um, Canadian Arthritis Research Conference. Mm -hmm. And one of the pre-sessional, or one of the topics was on chronic pain. And it's that, how do we de-stigmatize de mm -hmm. the experience of pain, particularly those you know who are living with objectively an invisible disease mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of that I think speaks really well to that that patient experience um, I wonder if I know you noted uh, some of the work that you're doing with the CSA and with others and I couldn't help but notice there's a few posters out there mm -hmm. um, on those studies mm -hmm. outside of what you shared is there anything else that you're excited about within that research you know, I think um, the, a lot of this stuff we still have to validate, and it hasn't been published yet, so it's a bit premature, but um, I think the, you know, it's one of the largest uh, data collection on uh, work impact uh, in the field of spondylitis, so I think that's going to be very interesting, and seeing how uh, the time it takes, delays for diagnosis, how long it takes to, uh, or the pathway that, that patients experience before getting diagnosed is going to be interesting. I think preliminary cuts were showing people were interacting with at least three uh, healthcare professionals before they made they were diagnosed with uh, with spondylitis, and so uh, you know a lot of uh, clinicians, healthcare providers have maybe never heard of this or yeah. uh, don't know too much about the condition, even though you know, a lot of studies would suggest it's as common as rheumatoid arthritis, and so everyone's heard of rheumatoid, or a lot of people heard of rheumatoid. Um, but not many people have really thought about ankles and spondylitis or axial spondylar arthritis. That's great. And I wonder, uh, just building off of that, whether uh, there are other exciting things that you've seen over the course of the several days of the CRA that make you think, you know, whether there are improvements to be, to be made. Or what, what excites you, I guess? Well, <laughs> in the field of spondylitis or field, in general? In, well, <laughs> we're talking about within the confines of CRA. We know there are other things that excite you. <laughs> yeah. Life excites me. No, <laughs> I, I think there are, um, you know, spondylitis tends to uh, follow whatever rheumatoid has done. And so I think there's a lot of new therapies that are coming out for rheumatoid that have been approved and are going to be coming out for spondylitis and the phase two studies look very promising. And it just creates more options for therapeutics um, in the field of spondylitis. So um, I think all the all the JAK inhibitors are working on their phase three studies uh, in the field of psoriatic, and and some of them have been approved already for uh, psoriatic arthritis. But the uh, there's some in the pipeline, and then there's the new TIC two inhibitors, which may uh, may increase uh, potentially 
uh, therapeutic effect for a lot of patients, so that's very exciting. So those are a lot of the kind of pharmacological approaches. Yes. And I know some of the emphasis that you have is on those non-pharmacological Oh, totally, approaches. totally. So I wonder yeah. if you could share a bit about that. Yeah, you know, I think we have great drugs, but they're not perfect. And not everyone needs, you know, a real uh, expensive drug. And I think uh, just as much as I try to emphasize uh, appropriate treatment when patients need it, I think I recommend all patients uh, try to uh, maintain activity, focus on core strength, and maintaining the range of motion, uh, keeping control of their weight. As we get older, our metabolism slows, and uh, sometimes that's uh, a difficult battle. But I think it's important uh, because uh, we see a lot of patients uh, maintain or lose function if, if they kind of let that aspect of life uh, get out of control. And so, you know, recognizing that, are there sometimes recommendations or resources that you recommend for patients to consult when considering? You know, there, there is some. Uh, in general, we've got a physiotherapist in our office and, and I have a number of physiotherapists who, um, who I kind of trust and, and I try to encourage patients to work with them. Uh, the problem is a lot of Canadians don't have extended coverage and it's difficult uh, to get access. Mary Pack Arthritis Center has been great, uh, but some people live too far away or uh, that doesn't always exist in every yeah. uh, center, uh, every province. And so uh, I think there's a big need. Uh, I think, I, you know, for patients who don't have access or live too far away or whatever reason, sometimes I just tell them to either join a local Pilates class or yoga class or uh, try to do some Aquafit uh, or even just at the very minimum you can YouTube something that's free yeah, yeah. do five ten minutes or, or I tell them you know work with a physio who's gonna teach you a home exercise program do two three sessions uh, and then you know incorporate that in your daily life and do you know 10 15 minutes on a daily basis if you can and I think that's um, you know it's something it's better than nothing but I think that's an area that we're, uh, there's a big need and uh, something that we've actually been exploring. Nothing, nothing definitive yet, but something that uh, I've just had a couple conversations about how do we create programs for people who don't have access to this. Yeah, and, and just to, to put a little plug, because mm -hmm. uh, there are exercises within some of the guidebooks mm -hmm. that the CSA has, yes. which are on our website. Mm -hmm. And there's also good resources in our sister organizations in the UK and in the U.S. just for those who don't have access but want very um, uh, low impact, uh, easy exercises mm -hmm. to help do these types of things. Totally. I noticed that there might be some questions and I look to uh, our expert Anita to share those. Do you have any self-management tips for people to manage pain? Mm. Well, I, I think <laughs> I try to encourage the exercise. Uh, I think sleep is very important um, for, for pain overall because I think a lot of patients do have soft tissue pain as well and fibromyalgia with all of our inflammatory conditions and uh, trying to encourage activity. Um, you know, I think it, if there's active disease and obviously treat that and, you know, if, when appropriate, I think uh, sometimes patients are a little fearful of, of side effects and it, it is a balance between uh, severity of symptoms, efficacy, and, and side effects, but uh, if patients need it, I think uh, thus far our therapeutics have fairly reassuring in terms of the side effect profile uh, in the vast majority of patients. Um, having a good support network, I think, uh, you know, getting involved in the CSA is uh, <laughs> yeah, that would be, you know, I, I think there's a lot of support in sharing that experience with other people. Uh, we've had a lot of um, uh, patient programs uh, run by the CSA and I think a lot of patients have been uh, have expressed to me uh, that they feel reassured that they're not the only one yeah. struggling with this and they have someone who can they chat with absolutely are there no other questions I want to just close with um, asking you like a final question we know that uh, you know this meeting's theme is the 2020 vision mm -hmm. And so I wonder, you know, where 2020 is, you know, hindsight's the best sight, but looking forward, what do you uh, see in the future of arthritis and research? Mm -hmm. Maybe 10, 15 years down the, down mm. the line. Ah, oh, I need a crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think, I think there's a lot of things that are promising. 
Uh, I think the whole personalized medicine is it's inching its way forward and finding uh, in the area of therapeutics the right drug for the right person and yeah. trying to predict response. I think the microbiome is an area that we keep hearing about. We haven't really had any actionable steps quite yet. Uh, I think every patient wonders what can I change in my diet to impact this and you know there's a lot of things on Google but there's very little that's uh, supported by rigorous research um, and I'm, I'm open-minded to it and I think you know if they want to try it and if they notice benefit uh, you know maybe that's something that warrants more exploration um, I think those are and then of, of course I think the, the therapeutic uh, molecules are, that are improving as, as we speak so there's always uh, a lot of areas to be excited about in the coming coming years Great. And we're excited to see where Dr. Chan is in the coming oh, years. Thank you. Uh, so thank, thank you and, and thanks to our viewers. Uh, we really appreciate you tuning in.